Thank you so much for having me here. Ampex is one of my favorite Luxor conferences. I was uh, here in uh, New York City, Ampex 2019, 2018, something like that. I was in Ampex LA, always had a lot of fun. I expected to find New York like this. This time it didn't, <laughs> it didn't really go like that. So no, no cool pictures, but uh, breathable air. So, you know. Um, today we're gonna talk a lot about TCP. Who knows what TCP stands for? Okay, taking conference pictures, yeah, okay. Picture. All right. Thank you for indulging. Um, cool. Uh, so today I want to talk a bit about networking on the beam, and uh, which has become sort of my little passion project in the last few months. And uh, I see a, uh, I've met a bunch of familiar faces and a bunch of friends here, but uh, let me still introduce myself first. Uh, my name is Andrea. Um, I'm uh, online quite a bit, so you can find me pretty easily. I have a website you can visit with all the stuff, and you can follow me on uh, Twitter. That's, that's my account. Uh, I live in the undisclosed uh, part of Italy, uh, around the center. It's about an hour east of Rome. It's a small town. Uh, I, if you need to know anything about our culture, is that Italians are really, really passionate about Italian cuisine. Um, I don't really mind Italian cuisine that much, but uh, if you want to have fun, you go follow this Twitter account where it's a collection of internet comments from Italian people shouting at everyone else for ruining Italian food. Um, and some of you have been in my talks, and I always show this because it's like the like the best thing. Like it's just not uh, uh, it's impossible not to share. So I have some uh, gems that you might want to take a look at. Uh, we don't even know how to joke on your English food since it's already a joke. Very. <laughs> <laughs> How the hell can you even think about carbonara in a jar? How do you even think it could taste like carbonara? This is the biggest human disgrace ever. Uh, this one is great. So I'm going to Naples this Friday and I only have one question. Will I be killed if I order pineapple on pizza? I hope so. <laughs> and this is my, my favorite one is this one. It's, it looks like I'm taking food too seriously, but in reality, it's you not taking it seriously enough. So uh, it's it's great. Go follow it. It's it's fantastic. This is uh, this is where I live. Um, it's it's truly like that. So, anyways, um, I started to work at a company called Vips, uh, spelled with two E's, um, and it's a platform for streaming live uh, music uh, shows from bands and artists. Uh, it's pretty neat. Uh, Foo Fighters um, just announced a new drummer a couple of weeks ago on Vips. Did anybody watch that? The new announcement. Did anybody? Does anybody know who Foo Fighters are? Okay, so, so they didn't really target the, their audience, I guess. But anyways, they, they announced their drummers there, so it's, like, uh, it, it's going well. Uh, the whole thing is built in Elixir with live view and a bunch of cool stuff. Uh, not the topic of the talk today, but a very, very cool place. I just started, but it's going great. Um, I started using Elixir on 2014, uh, which is a long time ago. I've been a member of the Elixir team for seven years now, and it's uh, just around the time now where I have to update the, the stuff to say seven years, because I, I think I joined around this time seven years ago. It's been a long ride. Um, I co-wrote a book about testing Elixir, uh, which has been out for a while now. If you get the code from Sophie, uh, don't use it for this book. This book, buy it. Buy it with real money. Uh, it's much better. Uh, <laughs> And a few months ago, I also started working on another book as well. And you might guess the topic because I'm here talking about this, but it's called Network Programming in Erlang and Elixir. And it will be out sometime. Uh, we, don't, we don't know. It'll just be out. Um, cool. So let's get started on our talk. Uh, what are we going to talk about? Uh, first of all, um, let me say this. I don't, I don't think I can teach you anything in... 40 minutes, 35 minutes, what we have. Uh, so the goal of the talk for me is really to generally give you just ideas, spark the thoughts in your brains, and like show you things that you might not know, uh, and that you can go properly learn after this, right? That's the goal. Um, so we're gonna do just a, like a whirlwind tour, whirlwind tour of networking on the Beam today. Um, and we'll start by talking a bit about why the Beam, I think, is such a fantastic feed for networks. So I'll, I'll give a little bit of hand wave. This is my favorite part of the talk, because I just, to really hand wavy stuff and it doesn't like not technical at all. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, some design patterns and techniques to write first servers on the beam and then clients on the beam. Uh, so that's the plan. Um, and let's get started. Uh, so first of all, why is the beam a great fit for um, network programming? 
Um, I think uh, I want to start from an analogy that I think I, I first heard from Joe Armstrong probably or read from him. Um, it just stuck with me ever since. And the analogy is essentially that the way that processes and messages work on the beam reflects the way that the real world works and especially the way that people works, right? So in this analogy, the analogy starts with processes being compared to people. So a process is a person, right? And uh, first up, a person can only do one thing at a time, right? So, you, you know, we have some sort of multitasking, but we really can do one conscious cognitive task at once. Uh, and that's exactly like processes. So processes in Erlang and Elixir, they are um, sequential. They e execute one instruction at a time, and a single process cannot be doing more than one thing at once, right? So one similarity is, is there. Um, then, while each person does things sequentially, um, people work concurrently with each other, right? And this is really the same as processes, of course. So uh, I'm here speaking, you're there listening, we're doing that at the same time. Processes do things sequentially in their own little world, but then concurrently with each other. So this keeps on uh, uh, matching, right? Uh, onto memory, people have brains, and they have thoughts, and they have memory inside the, the brain, right? And they can, can they share these memories with anybody? Uh, well, not with the current technology, right? Like you can't, you just delete it. So let's just say no. Um, and this is kind of like the memory of processes. So a process that not, does not share any of its memory with any other processes, and other processes don't really know what the process is doing or what are its memories, right? So there's like um, no shared allocated memory. It's the same with people. Like we can't really share, properly, truly share memory. Um, one more thing about this is that our memory and thoughts are sort of immutable if you think about it. So uh, once you have a memory, it sort of can't really change. I mean, we sort of modify memories, but in principle, it shouldn't, right? Like you have a memory and it's been archived in your brain and that's it. And thoughts are immutable too. Like once you have, a, you have had a thought, you can't really change that thought. You had it, right? Um, and all of this works like memory for processes, right? Like the, pro the memory of a process is immutable. The data in the, in the memory of a process cannot be changed. It can only be removed and new data can be created, right? Um, it's, it can never change existing data. So it's, it's sort of how we are supposed to work. Um, and the interaction side of things instead, so uh, processes and people kind of works, right? Um, and when it comes to communication between processes and then communication between people, the analogy still holds, I think, because how do humans share information? Um, if I have a thought or if I have a memory, how do I copy it over to someone else's brain? I tell them, right? Uh, or I write about this, so like any other form of communication. But in all, ca in all of these cases, I have to communicate, right? And I can't connect to someone else's brain and just dump information. I can just insert information in their brain. I actually, I can, I can't give them direct access to my brain. I actually have to communicate information, right? And communicating information, if you think about it, it's sort of like uh, copying information, right? It creates copies of that information. So it's it's sort of imperfect in the real world, but let's just, let's just say it's not. And uh, the idea is that when I talk to someone, I'm uh, when I'm talking to you, I'm copying information onto your brains, right? Uh, you're receiving information and making copies of your information. Um, so you might see where I'm going with this, because this is the same as message passing on the beam, right? Like well, uh, it's exactly how processes share information and they share, they share memory. So if process A wants to get a piece of data to process B here, the only way it can do that is to send process B a message. So it's a message-based communication. And sending a message from one process to another copies that message from the process of the memory of the source, pro from the memory of the source process to the memory of the destination process. And if you want to push this analogy a little bit more, we even have that speaking is asynchronous and listening is synchronous, which is sort of how sending messages is um, asynchronous and receiving messages is blocking, it's synchronous, right? Because um, like when I speak, you have no, I have no way of knowing if you're actually uh, listening. I just like put my words out there and I hope that like they get, eventually get to you. Um, but uh, if, if I want to make sure that, uh, that you are receiving the things that I'm saying, you have to acknowledge, right? So I, I like you have to do this, and then I know that you understood what, like that you the, the words got to you, right? And um, this is exactly how you would implement a request response process interaction, right? Where a process sends a message, but it can't know that the message got there. It has to sort of have an acknowledgement back from the other process, right? Um, and when it comes to receiving messages in the beam, uh, receiving messages is blocking. So even though there's it's a bit more nuanced because there's part of matching and selective receive and timeouts and all this stuff. At the heart of it, it's like a blocking operation. You're waiting for messages to come. And this is sort of the same as listening, right? Because like, I can't listen to someone if they're not speaking. I have to wait for them to speak. So it's sort of like, a, like a, the, the analogy still matches up. This makes a lot of sense to me. I love this thing. I think it's why I like to program in Elixir so in, in Erlang and on the Beam so much, because it makes a lot of sense. But wh where do networks come into play here? 
Um, if you think about it, networks of computers really follow the exact same analogy that I just talked about, right? Because as we've done with processes, we can do with computers on a network. So you have independent computers, which are people, which are processes in the analogy, and each of those independent computers lives a life of its own, right? With its own memory and its own resources and its own bits and team behavior, as we heard this morning. So they're, they're like completely separate, right? And there is no shared memory in networks either. And before you mention, like you think about stuff like a database, that's just another computer in the network, right? It's not really shared memory. It's just another part of the distributed system of, of these computers in the network. Um, and these machines can talk with each other to share memory and to share information, but the semantics are really just the same as the analogy that you, we just made, right? So you can send messages, you're not gonna really know when they're gonna get to the receiver unless the receiver acknowledges, right? It's exactly the same as sending processes or as speaking. Um, and the similarity between the beam process architecture and the computer networks is even stronger, I think, than the one between the beam and the people, because um, especially if we focus on stuff like TCP, uh, like the, the, the TCP protocol, right? Because in that case, the message semantics are exactly the same, because in TCP, messages are guaranteed to be eventually delivered, and they're guaranteed to be delivered in the same order that they were sent, um, which is exactly the same as messages on the beam, which are guaranteed to be delivered and in the same order that they were sent, unless the connection break, which is the same as unless the destination process dies, but that's, um, the messages are gonna get there and, and in order. So I think this is at the heart of why network programming on the beam is so smooth, because the abstractions, are between, the abstractions in the beam are the same abstractions that we have in networks. And the whole language environment has primitives, I think, that match up with the ones that you can find in networking, right? So take an example, like a gen server that manages a TCP socket, right? So in the processes and the socket are such like a great match up because the life of the socket is linked uh, to the life of the process. And if data comes to the socket, it gets delivered as a message to the process. And the whole thing is asynchronous and it's reactive by design, like they just match uh, in semantics. It matches how they work together, right? Uh, and you know, I'm glossing over a lot of details on TCP here, but you get the idea. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking about, if you worked with TCP in Erlang and Elixir, you might know about you know, the passive mode for sockets and like some stuff doesn't really match with this, uh, with this analogy. But still, like I think the core of the thing is that they, they are a really good uh, fit. They, they pair really well together. Um, so the analogy is over. Hopefully it makes sense. I, I think it does make sense a lot. Uh, I think it's why, you know, as I said, I like to work with Elixir because of this. I like, um, I think Elixir is a good, uh, and Erlang are a great fit for networks. Um, but now let's move on to talking about a little bit about writing servers and writing clients on the, on the Beam, like network clients, uh, and talking about patterns to do stuff like that in Elixir and Erlang. And I want to do a little quick recap of um, network programming first. So who actually knows what TCP means? <laughs> the real one, not the, uh, okay, so like, I don't know, transport uh, connection protocol, I don't know, something like that. Anyway, tra transport control protocol. Transmission control protocol. <laughs> it, did I get the P right? I got the P right at least, okay. <laughs> Uh, so I, I like to talk about the TCP mostly because it's the most common protocol out there, I think, and most importantly, I think it's the one that you're most likely to have direct contact with in your day-to-day -day work. I think there are you know, other network protocols, UDP is a big uh, um, con contender sort of for like different applications, but I think that if you're working um, with Elixir, there are good chance, like the much better chances that you're working with TCP if you're working with a network protocol than UDP. Um, and uh, for example, TCP is what you usually use to communicate with um, databases, right? Message queues. Uh, if you want to write a database driver for Postgres for MySQL, like you're going to have to write it. It's essentially TCP um, using TCP, right? And if you want to write a HTTP client, it's TCP. Uh, HTTP is TCP underneath. Uh, you got a cluster of nodes, Erlang nodes communicating with each other. They communicate through TCP as well, right? So TCP is really um, everywhere. And I'm glossing over. Um, SSL, and I'm not, not talking about SSL very much because it's uh, SSL TLS, uh, whatever you want to call it, and it, it's just the same as TCP from a network perspective, just encrypted. Uh, and since we're talking here about network principles and network design, design patterns and stuff like that, I like it's just encryption on top of that. So from the network perspective, let's you can assume that. Uh, cool, um, yeah. <laughs> So you can assume that uh, that's the work of the uh, SSL over there. Um, so this disclaimer out of the way, let's see if 
Oh, it's encrypted in the sense that it doesn't work, yeah. Because <laughs> I can't move on to the next slide. Okay. It's fine. We're prepared for this. I am trying turning it on and off again, basically. Hmm. Worked on my machine. <laughs> there you go. Cool. Um, switch imports, huh? Uh, TCP. Uh, so it's a network protocol. Um, I think who of you has actually wor worked with TCP directly? Okay, who knows like what TCP is about even if they haven't used it directly? Okay, that's good. Uh, so very quick uh, sort of recap. So TCP is a network protocol uh, that lets you do bi-directional communication between a client and a server. And the connection between a client and a server is persistent, so it's, they, they stay connected, and the data, is the, the, the data that go, this flows in both directions is guaranteed to be delivered and to be delivered in the order that it was sent. Uh, that's what we just mentioned earlier. Um, and at the center of TCP, of the protocol, there is the socket, this uh, data structure, sort of abstraction, and it's usually an operating system level abstraction over some lower level network stuff in the network stack, so it's an abstraction over like, a port and an address and like routing packets and all this stuff that we don't. Uh, it's a little bit too level for uh, for this. Uh, but in general, the socket represents a TCP connection on both sides. So it's uh, a client has its socket and uh, a server has its socket and they're connected together. And the most important difference really between a server socket and a client socket is that you create, uh, uh, is how you create the socket in the first place, right? Which is the clients create a socket by connecting to a server while servers create sockets by listening for connections and accepting clients. So that's, that's the, the establishing the connection is sort of the only unidirectional operation in TCP, because um, like the, the handshaking is, is initiated by the client, um, everything else is sort of symmetrical. And once a socket is created, yeah, it behaves mostly the same for client and server side. Um, Erlang has pretty robust and complete support for networking stuff in its under library. Um, for, for most protocols, for UDP, for TCP, for, for even like higher level protocols, like HTTP has some stuff, DNS has some stuff. Um, so um, there's, there's really good support for, for networking stuff. And in our case, with TCP, there isn't, it's no exception. We have this Gen TCP module that ships with Erlang standard library that lets you do all sorts of TCP related stuff. It's essentially an interface to the, so the sockets provided by um, the operating system. And uh, if we're talking about the server side here now, so if you're a server, there are two things you need to do to accept TCP connections and create sockets. First, you call Gen TCP to listen um, and start listening for TCP connections, and this sort of binds the, the uh, server to a given port and address, and it's like where clients are supposed to connect to. So when you connect to uh, google.com port 443, you're actually uh, hitting a server that's listening on the port, right? Um, and the listen socket is a single entity in your server. So you can start one listen socket on the port and then it's just that socket. And then from that listen socket, you can get um, sort of sockets that connect to the two clients um, and you can call gen TCP accept to accept connections, right, through this listen socket. And this is pretty, pretty much what a server looks like. Like you um, start a listen socket, you bind it to a port and an, and an address and then you start accepting connection. And then once you have a socket, you can treat it as a client socket, you can just send data through it and receive data through it. Um, most of the interesting stuff regarding service is really related to scaling the service up, so we'll just, just jump, uh, jump straight uh, into that. Um, the most naive, let's see. Aha, uh -huh, this I did this animation, huh? Um, so the most naive approach to TCP server here is to open a list and socket um, on the top left, and then you go into this accept loop. Um, so whenever gen TCP accept returns a socket, um, the client tries to connect basically, and then the, um, our server can spawn a process, for example, a new process, this handler process that you see over here on the right. Um, and it can spawn that, and that process will just ha like handle the communication with the client, uh, and they have a socket on the server side and a socket on the client side and talk to each other. Um, and then the server goes back to accepting the next connection. This, uh, uh, this process could be a joint server or something, and this is sort of what you can call like an accept loop, right? This is usually what it's referred to. And this, this is a naive, naive approach, but it already shows how good the beam is for this stuff, because in other environments, 
you really have to like likely handle multiple connected clients in the same process or the same thread because you wouldn't be able to afford spawning a single process or a single thread for every single connection that you get on your um, server, right? So in a lot of environments, you have a pool of like threads uh, that handle these connections, and instead in, on the beam, you have you you achieve a conceptual true. Uh, concurrency by being able to do stuff like spawning a single process for each uh, for each client, right? Like processes are are very cheap on the beam, so they're very easy to deal with. And the other good thing about processes is that they're isolated. This is a huge thing of why uh, writing servers on the beam is so nice because processes are isolated, and it's a huge deal in case like this because it means that failure in the process that it's handling a connection doesn't propagate to other processes, right? So if a process that's handling a, a client crashes for any reason, it doesn't propagate to the other processes, it doesn't cause problems, right? It's not the same as if you're using, a, for example, a, a thread pool, and one thread is handling multiple connections, and the thread fails, then the thread is going to bring down multiple connections, likely, right? So it's just, it's, it's a lot easier to deal with this sort of stuff. It's sort of built into the, baked into the language, right? It's pretty easy to build, like, resilient servers um, with these tools. And the second, a uh, really good thing here is that memory management is isolated in the processes, right? So there is no global garbage collection on the beam. Um, every process garbage collects itself, as you probably know, and this is usually fast since the memory of a single process is usually not that big, so it's pretty fast to garbage collect a single process. And in any case, uh, uh, so in, in, in all likelihood, clients will just not perceive garbage collection happening. And in any case, uh, there's no global GC pause like there is in other uh, virtual machines or other languages where, um, in other language environments where uh, there's a global pause for when GC is done and then the server has like the spikes of the response time. So you don't get that because of the process architecture of the beam. So uh, I'm kind of like singing the praises of this approach. Um, so why did I say that it's the most naive? Um, there are a couple of issues with this approach. The first one is that we can potentially spawn an unbounded number of uh, processes for clients connecting, right? Um, so um, we can spawn a lot of processes through in, on the beam, but there are other limits in our system as well. For example, how many database connections we can use if our client's handling involves talking to a database, or um, you know, we're limited by the resources of the server, like memory and CPU and stuff, how much stuff we can actually do in parallel. So we probably want to still put a cap on you know, spawning uh, processes handling clients. And an easy way to do that in Elixir is just use a dynamic supervisor. It has a max children option. So uh, the re slightly revisited server is that instead of spawning uh, connection handling process, client handling processes, um, it spawns an, um, under a dynamic supervisor so that it, at some point, dynamic supervisor will stop accepting new processes, essentially. So easy way to deal with that. Um, the other bottleneck here is accepting connections because in the server that we just described, uh, we open this list and socket, and then we have only a single process doing the accept loop, like calling accept continuously, right? But a lot of the time, you could have like storms of clients trying to connect, right? And connecting, spawning, like creating a socket for each one of them sequentially could, can be a bottleneck, right? So, but a bunch of time ago, I think it was OTP like 13, like a long time ago at this point, uh, but Erlang added the possibility for multiple concurrent processes to call GenTCP accept on the same list and socket at the same time. So this effectively, you can create what we usually call an acceptor pool. So a bunch of processes calling GenTCP accept on the same list and socket, right? So that you can accept new connections in parallel. An acceptor pool goes like this. We still have one single process that calls GenTCP listen. It returns a list and socket. And then the server can spawn a pool of processes that call GenTCP accept using that list and socket. And each of those uh, acceptor processes performs the same accept loop that we saw before, where it just uh, calls accept and accepts clients, spawns uh, handling processes under a dynamic supervisor, for example, uh, but you can do the accepting in parallel, which is like um, definitely easier to scale, right? And so this is the uh, sort of my final shape for a uh, state-of-the-art uh, socket server on the beam looks like and uh, sort of the visual rep representation. Um, and in this, you have a dynamic supervisor that's managing, that's the one on the leftmost side. It's the dynamic supervisor I talked about that's managing the single process handling connections. And then you have a supervisor who's got the listener process under it, uh, that's spawning and holding the listen socket, the single listen socket. And then you have the acceptor pool with a bunch of acceptor, like a pool of processes that do the accept loop, right? And this is actually, um, a bunch, how a bunch of libraries in Erlang and Elixir look like. So um, it's sort of unlikely that you uh, 
I, like, I think it's unlikely that you're actually going to do this stuff manually too much unless you're writing one of these libraries because there are solutions out there that do this for you. So it's unlikely that you have to do it by hand. Um, so usually there are, there, there are a bunch of libraries that give you like behaviors to say, oh, data comes from a client, great, I can do this. Or a client connected, I can do this. Like react to this event in a sort of behavior-oriented way. Um, I really like the Thousand Island library, which is uh, the library that powers the Bandit web server. But uh, yeah, yeah, for example, Thousand Island is a socket pooling library, essentially. So you can build very easily build like a TCP so server uh, with an acceptor pool and sockets and everything and just by having uh, like a behavior with a few callbacks and bringing the library in. Um, so this is, this is great. Um, moving on to class. So this is the server side. Those are the challenges, mostly scaling up. This, uh, um, this picture is also from the book. So uh, I'm excited about that. Um, but uh, what does it look, this look like from the client side instead? Right? So we talked about the server side. The other side is the clients. Um, and once a connection, a single connection on its own has been established, exchanging data between server and client looks pretty similar from both sides. You send data, you receive data very, with the exact same API, so it's very similar on both sides. Um, however, clients have a unique challenge that servers don't really have to worry about, which is uh, reconnections, right? So if you think about it, servers never really have to worry about reconnecting to clients, because after, I mean, after all, if, you, if the connection between a client and a server breaks for any reason, the server cannot possibly reconnect to the client, right? Because the client is just not accepting even connections. Uh, plus, like, where, who knows where the client is? But in general, like, it's not accept accepting connections. So if a connection between the client and the server breaks, the server can't care, really. Um, so this takes a whole set of problems away from building servers, because you don't really have to think about reconnections, right? So that's one unique challenge to clients that we'll talk about. And the other challenge is pooling. So we talked a little bit about these acceptor pools, but um, so from the perspective of a server, it usually doesn't really matter where a client is connecting from uh, because all clients are generally handled in the same way. So you, you don't really care if like five clients, if you're a database, which is a, a server, right? Uh, and you have five clients connecting from the same machine or five clients connecting from five different machines, usually you don't care, right? Usually all clients look the same to you. So you don't really have to think about this uh, sort of pooling um, strategies to, uh, fr from the perspective of a client, you, you have to, from the pr perspective or rather of an application connecting to a server, for example, establishing a pool of client connections can be really vital to achieve stuff like resiliency, you know, accept or acceptable throughput because you have to like parallelize talking to the server or you have to um, be able to deal with situations where a connection goes down and you have other connections that don't go down, right? So uh, resiliency is like part of resiliency as well, right? And so usually these are the two big topics uh, around the clients, uh, I think, which are like, you know, reconnection and pooling. Um, so talking about reconnections, uh, the real question, like having the client reconnect to the server is not really hard. Like if, if the connection drops, you just, you know, restart, the, you recall GenDCB Connect or, uh, or whatever you are using and you, you know, like you reconnect. So the thing that uh, that's sort of uh, challenging when talking about reconnections is understanding when you want to reconnect, right? And usually, you don't want to reconnect right away when a connection breaks because that would likely, likely cause a lot of strain on the server. And if you think about it, there are really two common scenarios when connections break, right? The first one is when a connection breaks in a truly temporary way. So for example, this can happen when a server closes idle connections, right? So imagine you have a, you have a web server with a bunch of HTTP connections. Um, at some point, your connection is not sending data, and the server decides to shut down that connection because it's been idle, right? If you reconnect right away, it's likely that the server will accept your connection because it's not. It's a very. It's like it just closed it for a very temporary um, situation, right? So in that case, reconnecting once right away works well. Um, but if that single first reconnection attempt fails, it's really unlikely that if you reconnect once more right away it's going to succeed, right? Because it's, it's likely that there's some condition, possibly transient, transient going on on the server, that causes the server not to really accept connections, right? So it could be server is out of memory, you know, the resources are saturated, or the server lost network connection, or the client lost network connections. And these are all conditions that sort of are not resolved, usually not resolved instantly, like they require a little bit of time. And in this situation, um, keeping to do quick, these quick attempts at reconnecting is just not a good strategy because it puts strain on the client, it puts strain on the server, it's like not good for anyone. So clients usually use a backoff, which is a period of time between reconnects. Um, 
and the back of itself in clients becomes usually comes with a few possibility uh, possibilities on implementing this. Uh, if you use a fixed back of like say one second, um, and you have a pool of clients, that's usually not optimal because you run into this problem, which is called, called the thundering herd problem, which is where, for example, a server loses network connection, and you have a few clients connected to it. And they all disconnect, and then they all try to reconnect after one second. And if it's you know many clients, that can become a problem for the server because the server now has to suddenly accept like a lot of connections all at the same time, right? So say if the server rebooted, and then now it needs to accept a bunch of connections at the same time. And um, uh, this is really hard for the server usually. So the fix for this is usually to introduce uh, randomness or jitter. It's called also, uh, but introduce random a small random variation to the backups, right? So instead of saying, for example, if you connect every one second, you say, okay, reconnect every one second plus or minus some number between like zero and like uh, a half, 500 milliseconds, say, right? Um, so that you spread out the reconnections more evenly. Um, and the other backoff technique that you'll commonly see in, in actual code in place is uh, using exponential backoff. And exponential backoff means just increasing the backoff every time you try to recon on every reconnection attempt usually in an exponential way, meaning like it can be, uh, for example, you reconnect after one second, then two, then four, then eight, or you know the exponent can be lower, but usually it, goes, uh, it, it grows exponentially. Um, and the idea behind that is that if a connection cannot be established, like for example, if a connection goes down, you try after one second, it doesn't work. If you keep trying one second, it's unlikely that like, you know, you, it will reconnect uh, it, within a reasonable amount of time. So you just space out the reconnections a bit so that you don't put unnecessary strain on the server and unnecessary strain on the client. And that uh, line up there means just that usually there's a cap on the back, of course, like otherwise very quickly you would stop retrying. But usually you do like, okay, from 100 milliseconds to 30 seconds, you go exponentially and then you try every 30 seconds, which might be a reasonable amount of time, something like that. Um, and you will see this usually what you see in practice is actually a combination of all these techniques. So you see random exponential back, randomized exponential back of something like this, so where you have you know, back off that is exponential plus a little bit of a random factor so that you avoid the thundering herd as well. So that's the back off. Uh, when it comes to pooling, um, there are a few types of pools that you can build um, on the beam. This is more specific to the beam. Um, the, in general, the most common approach to clients in general on the beam, uh, regardless of pooling or, or backups or anything, the most common approach is to have a process that owns the TCP socket, right? So for example, a gen server that keeps the TCP socket in its state and keeps it alive because the socket is linked to the process, right? And then you have callers that want to interact with the socket that you, you want them to communicate with the socket owner process somehow. And starting from, the, from that foundation, you really have two uh, choices for pooling, I think. Uh, you can either pass the socket around to callers uh, and let callers use the socket directly, or you can proxy communication with, this, uh, with the socket via the socket owner. So let's look at both approaches. In the first one, the role of the owner process is really just to keep the socket alive and hold it while it's not being used by callers, right? Then whenever a caller needs to interact with the socket, the socket owner checks out the socket from the caller, uh, from the, um, uh, sorry, the socket owner checks out the socket to the caller, so now the caller has the socket, it can interact with the socket, it can send data, it can receive data, and then it checks it back in, uh, in the socket owner. And the reason why uh, you wanna build pull this way, pulls this way somehow, uh, sometimes is that uh, exchanging data with the socket directly is very, very efficient. Uh, instead of passing data around between processes, because it uses like sending and receiving data on, on Gen TCP, for example, uses um, like uh, operating system primitives, right? Like uh, system calls to actually send the data and receive the data from the socket directly. So there's no copying of data across processes within the beam. Um, and this approach only, ha uh, however, only really works if your server follows a, this uh, request response model. So where callers can check out the socket, send some request data, get back some response data, and then check the socket back in, uh, into its owner. Um, if the server, for example, was the one originating messages to the socket, then we wouldn't know um, which caller to give it to. So for example, if your um, if your server is a WebSocket server and your uh, client process is, is like a WebSocket process, sometimes it's a server originating messages for the client, right? And in the cases you can't have a caller check out the sockets because you don't know if data is going to come or not, right? So in this, um, and the other challenge with this approach actually is also that um, you have to queue callers sometimes, right? So if you have, for example, if you have a pool of n clients 
uh, with each uh, each one of them having a socket, and they are all temporarily checked out to some callers. And the new caller wants to check out the socket, then you have to put that in a caller in a queue somewhere. That caller in a queue somewhere. Usually, you do it in the pool itself, and then you can just pop the caller off the queue when uh, when a socket frees up. And this checkout approach is usually of it, this checkout approach and the pooling approach that I just talked about. They're used quite frequently in the wild, and I think the biggest example that all of us are familiar with is the big connection, which is the library that. Uh, powers the Postgres and MySQL, all the database adapters that Ecto uses. Um, so the B connection uses this pooling strategy of checking out sockets. Um, and it also have a, has a very, very smart depends queuing system, uh, which is sort of like the core of the library. And I'm sure you're familiar with the queue system because you've seen the errors that say the B connection, like uh, the, the thing was waiting in the queue too long, so we like the B connection, connection error. Um, that's probably what you're, you're, you're definitely from. I, I've, I'm definitely familiar with that mo the most in the B connection. <laughs> and, uh, so this is one way to, to build pools. The other way to build pools is that uh, having, is having a, the socket process be a proxy between the caller and the socket itself, right? So in this case, uh, callers can send data to the socket owner. The socket owner sends the data to the socket. Then the socket sends the data to the socket owner, and the socket owner sends it back, finds the caller it belongs to, and sends it back to, sends it back to the caller. And this is good when you, um, it's, it, it's less efficient when, uh, it comes to moving data around because you're copying data in the beam. Like you're copying data, for example, from the caller to the socket owner, from the socket owner to the caller, just copying data. But it has one uh, pro, which is that it takes advantage of TCP multiplexing. And multiplexing is a property of TCP where data can flow in both directions at the same time. Um, and so with the pooling approach that we talked about a second ago of checking out sockets, a caller that checked out the socket is either just sending a request or receiving a response. It can't really do both at the same time. Um, and in this proxy approach, instead, the socket owner can send data for one request while the socket, like the OS, is buffering data for another request, essentially, right? So effect effectively taking advantage of uh, the TCP multiplexing. Uh, this pooling approach, though, only works with, um, if you've worked with a server that, uh, whose protocol um, has, like, allows you to identify which response belongs to which request in some way. So for example, Postgres uses ID. When a client makes a request, it has an ID, so when data comes back, you know which uh, client it's destined, it's like um, directed at. And uh, red is, for example, is another example where it doesn't use an ID, but it's single threaded. So you know that if you send responses, they, if you send requests, then the responses come back in the same order. So it's easy to queue clients, queue, queue callers, essentially, right? And speaking of red, is this uh, pooling approach of the proxy. Um, socket owner is actually used by Redix, which is the uh, one of the uh, Redix clients for Elixir. So it's uh, it's used in practice as well. If you want to go see an example, uh, so for bonus content about um, clients uh, is what to do when a client is offline. So for example, if the connection breaks or something, right? And my personal preference is to build clients that are general, somehow based on Gen State M, which is a for those who don't know, Gen State M is a behavior in Erlang OTP fairly recent, like I think OTP 19, and it allows you to model state machines, and it's, I think it's great for modeling clients which, are, which usually have like a disconnected and a connected state, right? And generally, I like to do something where uh, if, a con if a request comes to the client when it's in a disconnected state, then you handle it by queuing it or returning an error or whatever. Uh, if it comes in the connected state, you actually send it over to the forward, it over to the server. Um, and JSTM also makes it very easy to implement back off through timeouts uh, and stuff like that. So I, re I highly recommend just going um, to the JSTM documentation and reading about it because it's, uh, it's really good. Um, conclusion, uh, let's wrap, wrap this up. Um, what about let it crash? I hate let it crash. It's a terrible way of putting, uh, I think, this into, because it's like a, it's, it's a very easy to misunderstand uh, slogan, I think, uh, because I don't think it works here. I think let it crash as a philosophy, it works only for unexpected errors. Like the cool thing about let it crash is that we have unexpected errors. We have unknown unknowns in, in our code, right? Like we write bugs that we don't know about, otherwise we wouldn't write the bugs if you know about them, right? So if you expect errors, you're, I think you're generally much more, like much uh, better off just handling the errors that you expect, right? And in networks, it, not only errors are expected, they are sort of like not even errors, because like connection dropping is not an error, it's just like an event that will happen throughout the course of the connection's life, it will just happen. So 
uh, crashing the process. So it's not like, I think it's not a good strategy in cases like that where you know exactly that something will happen and you, you should probably like handle it gracefully, right? And with let it crash, you also lose control over how you recover from errors, for example, right? If you want to spend a fun af afternoon, um, you can go read RabbitMQ's uh, source code, like AMQP source code. They have this thing called Supervisor 2, uh, whose job is essentially to implement back offs on top of like supervisor restarting. So they re-implement the supervisor so that when a process crashes, you can actually wait between, be, before restarting it. All because the process crashes when the connection goes down. So I think that's like, that's, that's the model, like maybe don't let it crash in the first place, you know? <laughs> uh, so is there anything hard about building network applications on the beam? I think so. I think the hardest thing is concurrency and the analogy of people and processes doing things concurrently makes a lot of sense, but concurrency is still hard to reason about. And this is true in the real world too, because it's it's sort of like hard to clearly imagine, for example, large organizations of people doing things. I can I can reason about one person, I can reason about a few people, a small team, but it's hard to see big, big uh, groups of people doing stuff. It's hard to reason about that, right? And the same goes with processes and like the systems when it's hard, when they become a, like very concurrent with a lot of actors. Um, but still Elixir gives you sort of like the, I think the be Elixir and Erlang and the Beam, they give you the sort of the, the best, um, best in class uh, primitives to deal with all this stuff, even though concurrency is still hard. And you also have the distributed systems aspect, right? There are problems we saw in the keynote this morning, there are problems that are inherent to distributed systems that like no language, no tool, no framework is gonna help you with. They're just like problems that have, that have been proved to live in the distributed system space and that you can't really do anything about. But still, having a tool that makes it nice to work with this sort of stuff, I think it's, uh, it's great. And um, if you think about it, the Beam was actually designed with networks in mind, I think, right? And I, so back then it was telephone switches, right, when it was, in, when it was introduced, uh, but those, those are still networks. Right, and, and I like to think that a lot of the primitives that are in the beam, they actually take inspiration from networks, right? Because like the process and the way that uh, communication works, I like to think that it takes inspiration from networks because um, they are such a good match up. Um, and last but not least, there's a bunch of resources that you can go um, read about. Uh, I will upload this the slide deck so you can go see this. There are actually clickable links in the slide deck so you can go check this out um, later. And needless to say, hopefully my the first beta of my book will be out sometime soon. So at that point, like you just like there's only one item in the list. It's the book. You buy it uh, for only 39.99. I have no idea how much it's going to cost, but you can uh, buy that thing. You can become an incredible network programmer. That's all. Thank you. Thank you.